So after the way that I cut that off, am I fired? Brianna, am I, am I oh, fired? there's no negative self-talk in our beach house. Oh, but. <laughs> it's actual rules. I need to, I need to joke a little bit. <laughs> This is Brianna Hagel, owner, operator, and head butcher at Vessel Meats in Dartmouth. Yeah, well, we're gonna break down some beef and show you all the little secret cuts that uh, you're not gonna find at the grocery store. So this is a front quarter of beef. It was uh, grown here in Nova Scotia, just outside of Truro. Um, I've already uh, broken it down a little bit. So it would come in basically like this with uh, the prime rib section here has already been removed to dry age. Um, and I've just uh, started peeling the shoulder off um, to expose some of these, uh, these more delicate, smaller muscles uh, under inside the shoulder. Which cuts are we going to look into today. Uh, we're gonna carve into some of my favorites. They're typically a little bit lesser known. Um, they're also like good individual little sized portions. Under here is the flat iron. It's right this here. This is gonna be some chuck meat. This is gonna be some chuck meat. So this would all be, like this is a whole muscle if you wanted to do a cross rib roast. When someone's looking at a butcher case and they're thinking, I know nothing about meat, like which one of these cuts is for grilling, which one is for stewing? How would you explain how visually you can tell what is something that's better for stew and what's better for grilling? The more tender they are, the more expensive they are. Um, so the tenderloin is the most expensive and prime rib and strip loin. If you look at something like this, so I mean, you can tell that the meat is very textured. I look at that and I think when that braises and some of these, um, you know, when it starts to fall apart, um, getting those nice like stringy pieces and like a rich stew is gonna be nice. This piece and like similar to the other pieces that we would put in stew are going to be more tough than something like the flank or the bavette, which are also like grainy cuts but they're not from the shoulder, and so they're not gonna have worked as hard in their life. Now we've removed our shoulder, so we're gonna capitalize on a few of these little muscles here. This guy right here is the Terrace Major. Um, I, I love Terrace Major. Yeah, it's a delicious little soft nugget, um, a good alternative to tenderloin. How do you know where a certain muscle kind of ends and another one begins. Like where you're following a line right yeah, now, kind so, of like a, a pocket. So this style of cutting meat is definitely more typical with the French. And what they'll do is they spend a lot more time like, like separating every muscle, basically following like the seams. Mm -hmm. Call it like some people will call it seam, seam work. And obviously this is beautiful and super red right now because we mm -hmm. just carved it out of here. Mm -hmm. But if I'm looking at, uh, at a case and I see a piece of meat that's a little bit darker, what should I, as a consumer, like infer from that? So if you're buying meat out of a fresh case where it's displayed in front of you, it's not wrapped in plastic, I'm not shying away from dark. People are really afraid of stuff being dried out in their fridge, but dried out is actually better than moist because again, bacteria are happier in a moist environment. So if the meat is dried out, maybe a little bit hard and crunchy on the top, like that's not the worst. When you put a piece of muscle on a pan at high heat, uh, the in initial reaction is that the muscle tissues or tech, uh, fibers are all just gonna go and like tighten up really quick. Yeah. Um, and so that's why high heat cooking only really works for tender muscles because when that has that reaction, then there's still gonna be some tenderness to it. There is a few different types of fat. This fat is pretty soft. You're gonna be able to chew through it and it's gonna provide a little bit of flavor. 
This fat is a little bit harder. I don't know if you want to touch it, yeah. but like it's definitely like not going to be as chewy and break down as nicely. Even if you rendered that, there's going to be some like fibrous pieces that won't render. So I'm just going to trim this up. How would you tell someone to prepare this if they were bringing it home? Let it rest on the counter for about half an hour before you're going to prepare it on, the, on your grill. Next muscle off? Sure, if you think that I'm. All right, so this is the Denver. So. This is my favorite one. So when you're cutting with a chef knife, this part of the blade is used the most. But when you're doing this kind of thing, you're really like working with the tip. So you can try that. So anything you can do to like have gravity like work for you is going to help you all day, every day. Give me your, your elevator pitch about, about Denver though. It has really great marbling and a little bit of chew. Our business is seven years old. We've been uh, here on in this location for a year. Um, and we're going through right now uh, like one cow a week. How much meat does it take to feed a community? Like really not that much if you have a lot of people who are like dedicated to trying different things. So I do actually have some chaos organization of the chaos here. This one looks like garbage. That's total garbage. Really hard fat, really connective tissue, things that aren't gonna grind well. This pile here is all the pieces that are gonna get ground up into meat. Like there's, this is where like we call it trim. This is, you know, what ground meat is made of. And then this, this pile here needs to, out, there might be some decent stew meat in there. So we're gonna cut into this and we're gonna see, you know, if we have some, some decent marbling in here or not. This piece is not like very straight and even, so that's gonna be a stew piece. Um, but we do have like some pretty decent marbling in there. When I see raw meat, I immediately want to eat it without cooking it. I love tartare. I don't know about you. So if someone contacts us and says that they want tartare, I would start with a new muscle. I would trim all the odor pieces off. Um, and then I'd make sure that we're working like with clean knives on a clean area of the table. My grandfather was a butcher mm -hmm. in Annapolis Royal, mm -hmm. and he would constantly be just like eating stuff mm -hmm. out of the butcher case. Would you do that? Like if I cut a piece off of oh, this definitely. right now, yeah. can I 100%, eat it? Yeah, 100%. Um, there you go. Super clean tasting, mm -hmm. really tender, so. really fresh. Growing up uh, in the 90s, mm -hmm. going to the grocery store with my mom, mm -hmm. it was always lean ground beef. Mm -hmm. We were having burgers, they were shrinking up on the sides, they were turning into little hockey pucks. Yep. I thought that's what burgers were supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that maybe they didn't have to shrink so much. People know that medium ground beef is gonna be like more flavorful, it's better for burgers, but it's also gonna cause more flare ups on the barbecue. Like a lot of people really, really still shy away from fat, mm -hmm. but fat is actually really good for you. It helps keep you full. In this dry aging process, because more moisture is coming out of the meat, your meat shouldn't shrink down as much in a shop like when your meat is all dry aged. So at the at the commercial level, the animals, the same day that they're slaughtered, are broken into primals and put in back bags. And then they can sit in those back bags for like 60 to 90 days. And they're never really drying out. They're never drying out. And so, ground. yeah, and they do that intentionally. Like it's, it's it, water is weight, it's water weight. All that moisture is still in it. And that's where you're seeing a lot of your water waste. So when we absorb more of that moisture cost, it raises our prices a little bit. But at the end, when you get it home, it shouldn't shrink down to like nothing. It's just um, less moist, but that also will mean more flavor. Where exactly is the brisket coming from? So, so this, like... so this, so if you imagine these bones are removed, this is all your brisket. This okay. is your brisket, like this will be your brisket. And like I said, we're gonna cut ours to probably about here. You know, when you get into like the south brisket smokes, they might cut it up here and, and make a longer, a longer brisket piece. I went down to Texas um, three or four years ago and did like a meat cutting thing down in Texas, and they didn't do like any braising cuts. They had their brisket, but like all of the like stewing cuts from the shoulder, they were like, oh, you just grind this, you just grind that, and it was just like, well, what do you mean? You just grind all these things. These are like beautiful braising cuts, and they're like, oh, we don't braise here because it's like hot all the time. Um, 
they only kind of do like your your smoking pieces and your your high-end grilling steaks. They don't do a lot of braising cuts. But yeah, I'm gonna lift this down off the hook. So we're gonna break this uh, just kind of in between here. It's gonna give us a good size brisket and some short ribs to work with. The difference between using a knife and a saw is that a saw tears and a knife cuts. It's gonna be some super nice marbled ribs right up here. It's beautiful. Beauty. Yeah. It is maybe slightly time consuming. This piece here is kind of like the flat of the brisket. And you see how it's more of like fat, meat, fat. And so this would be like uh, your Passover cut. All right, Jess, you ready to hang this up? Yep. Got her. I'm just gonna hug this. Here you go, ta-da. <laughs> Goodbye, my love. <laughs> So we're down to the rib plate, and the rib plate has a lot of diverse cuts, and there's a lot of different traditions when it comes to cooking the ribs. So I thought, um, you know, this would be a good opportunity to talk about about those different options. Am I in the splash zone here? No, there's not much splash. There's I'm no not splash. Just get like bone dust no. all over my face. No, but that would make good TV. <laughs> See like all this like kind of dust. This is like basically like sawdust. Is there anything wrong with eating this bone dust? No, but it's gonna be a yucky texture in your mouth. It's like the sawdust of meat and it's not gonna feel very good. Okay, I'm gonna be brave. It's not gonna be very good. Sand, I think sand I need texture. To spit this out, actually. Sand texture. <laughs> All of these, whether you're, you've got the English style cut, mm -hmm. what are we calling? Just these, I, I just call these braising ribs. If you cut them like between the bones like short that, rib. now you have a short rib. The one thing that you can change in the short rib is how thick they are. I cut these an inch and a half, but some people might do like two inches or one inch. Really, really butchering this one, no pun intended. All right, all right, all right. You want me to do it? Uh, it makes a better TV. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm handing it off to the pro. It is soft. There you go. You like 